he turned a dream into a global brand. I'm Dan Murphy, and on this edition of the CNBC Conversation, we speak with the Cobra Beer co-founder and chairman, Lord Karen Billamoria. Karen Billamoria made his name after co-founding Cobra Beer in 1989. Designed to complement Indian cuisine, the brand has since become synonymous with curry houses around the world. In 2011, Karen sold a majority share of the business to global drinks conglomerate Molson Coors as part of a partnership deal which allowed him to remain as Cobra's chairman. Today, Cobra is sold in more than 40 countries and, according to the company, sells the equivalent of 100 million bottles a year. Away from running a global beer brand, Karen has served as a member of the UK's second parliamentary chamber, the House of Lords, since 2006. In 2020, he became president of the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, speaking on behalf of 190,000 businesses on the domestic and international stage. And he's also Chancellor of England's University of Birmingham, which has just opened a brand new smart campus here in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, where I sat down with Lord Karen for our interview. Lord Karen Billamoria, welcome to the CNBC Conversation. Very good to see you, Dan. We meet here today at the beautiful campus of the University of Birmingham here in Dubai, of which you are Chancellor. How does it feel to be here today? I am absolutely top of the world to be here in Dubai at our brand new Birmingham University Dubai campus. I've been proud to be Chancellor of the University of Birmingham for seven and a half years now. Uh, it's a Russell Group University, that's the Ivy League in the UK, top 100 in the world, and a, a really great university in, in the UK, always has been 122 years old. And now to be the first Russell Group University to open up a campus in Dubai is just extraordinary. And uh, we've worked very closely with the government here of Dubai and the UAE, and uh, collaboratively to, together, together we have now got this state of the art. And when I say state of the art, We've worked in partnership with Siemens, one of the world's leading engineering companies. Uh, this is possibly the most advanced university campus anywhere in the world in terms of the technology that we have here. There are hundreds of sensors all around the building, sensors that enable us to uh, work out the flow of people in the building, the, the temperature, the climate. Um, it's all environmentally designed and, of course, technology to connect us with the main headquarters in Birmingham in the UK. Uh, so it, it's tremendous. And of course, through the pandemic, the world has been transformed in, in, in adapting and adopting technology, which would normally take years in terms of hybrid learning and remote learning. Well, that was always going to be the plan over here. We were ahead of the game. And why was it important for the university to have a campus here in the Middle East? Tell me about this international expansion. University of Birmingham has always been very international in its outlook. We've seen the potential of working internationally from a research point of view. And what about from a student point of view? What about from reaching out to somewhere like Dubai? And Dubai is a hub, it's a magnet. It's the most amazing diversity in this city and in, in the UAE. By having a campus here, we've got students not only from the UAE and Dubai, but students already. We started with 100 students in 2018 in a temporary campus nearby. We're now in the main building. And we're already at 700 students. And this has got a capacity of entry of 4,500 students. And those students right now are coming from all over the region, including from India, um, from South Asia, uh, from Africa, from all over. So from Russia, we've got students from China. So the stu and of course, from the UK itself. You were born in India, but you come from a very distinguished military family. How aware were you when you were younger of their achievements when you were growing up? I was very lucky to come from a family, both sides, my mother's family and my father's family, uh, of um, some extraordinary individuals who inspired me uh, throughout my life. My father being a soldier, uh, seeing firsthand leadership in action, learning from my father who commanded his battalion of Gurkhas in, in war, um, who eventually became commander-in-chief of the Central Army in India, with commanding 350,000 people. So some of my lifelong lessons that I've learned about leadership have been from my father. So for example, in the pandemic, I, it kept ringing through my ears the whole the way through. My father saying the true test of leadership is not in the good times, the true test of leadership is in times of adversity. And 
have we had an adverse time? The, uh, arguably since World War II, this is the biggest global challenge that we as a world have experienced. And so the leadership lessons that my father taught me have been invaluable. My mother's grandfather, who was a member of the House of Lords equivalent in India, the Raja Sabha, who was a great entrepreneur, philanthropist, great public servant, in many ways, that inspiration from him, four years later, I've been trying to implement myself in the UK. And his motto, my great-grandfather's, was to aspire and achieve. And I added uh, my motto for Cobra Beer is to aspire and achieve against all odds with integrity. And that's almost the definition of entrepreneurship. So you went on to create a global beer brand, but your first stroke of luck in business actually came from an idea to import polo sticks from India. How did that idea come about? I had a, a degree in commerce, I had a law degree, I was a qualified chartered accountant, I could have been an accountant, could have been a lawyer, could have been a banker, but actually I wanted to start my own business. And I had my big idea, the idea for Cobra Beer, but that was too big an idea. And uh, I was uh, playing polo for Cambridge University. I went back to India and I came back, the stick makers there said, you're, you know, you're from India, you live in England, can you sell some of our sticks for us? So I came back with a whole pile of sample sticks and I started selling them. And I sold them to Harrods, I sold them to Lily Whites, I sold them to Royal Family Saddlers. I was in business, and that got me off the ground on the journey business. So take me into the origins of Cobra beer then, and I guess most importantly, why was it important to you that this beer was manufactured in India when you were just getting started? I really disliked the beers that I was drinking. Um, many of the beers, the lagers, were too fizzy, were too gassy, they were very bloating. And the ales, English ales, which I took an instant liking to, but too heavy and too bitter to drink with food. And the fizzy lagers were terrible on their own and terrible with food. And with Indian food, you want something cold and refreshing with spicy food, but they were really uncomfortable to drink. So that's when the idea evolved. Why don't I produce my own beer that has a refreshment of a lager and the smoothness of an ale combined? It'll have a very balanced and rounded and drinkable taste it goes very well on its own, but also accompanies all food, and in particular Indian food. And I wanted it to have a globally appealing taste. And no better place to have a globally appealing taste to launch than London. Do you remember the time or do you remember the day when you first realized that your idea was paying off and this business actually had traction? You know that very quickly. And you know that through one simple thing, and that is reorders. So one thing is persuading a restaurant to take an unknown product when they already have lots of other beers. They say, we don't need you, we don't, we've got other beers. Mm -hmm. So you've got to persuade them to take your product to start off with, and that's based on the differentiation of your product, which is, be, which is different and better in a way that they will sell more beer and make more profit, and their customers will be happier because the product they prefer. Mm -hmm. But that takes a lot to convince the salesmanship to get them to take the beer. But once you've got the beer there, it's got to deliver and we got almost a 99% reorder from day one. And then that gives you the confidence when you know that people like your beer, you just extrapolate that into a global beer brand. And my mission from day one is find, produce the finest ever Indian beer, make it a global beer brand. And that's what I've been doing all these years. And then 2011 came along, you sold a 51% share to Molson Coors. Why did you make that decision and why was it the right move at the time? We were hit very badly by the financial crisis. Um, one of my favorite sayings is good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. And I've made lots of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I'd made quite a few mistakes. We were growing very rapidly. Cobra Beer in its first 18 years had a compound annual growth rate of 40, 40% per year on average for its first 18 years. But what that meant was I was sacrificing the bottom line and sometimes making losses to grow. And we had a lot of debt. And when the financial crisis came, um, one of our big financiers forced us to sell the business. I didn't want to do it, but I was forced to sell the business. And it was a very tough process, during which time I nearly lost the business. And it culminated in Molson Coors saying, we don't want to buy you, we actually want to create a joint venture with you, where you will continue as the chairman. And we will have 50.1, and you can have 49.9, but we run it as a joint venture, completely transparent, with you as chairman and with your team coming and joining us and integrating an entrepreneurial company with one of the largest multi-billion dollar brewing companies in the world. Mm -hmm. And that has now existed since 2009 and I'm glad to say has been uh, a great success. 
are you concerned that the success of that brand that you created is now in the hands of a very large conglomerate? It was always going to be a challenge putting uh, an entrepreneur-run company and a company with an entrepreneurial way of working with a large multi-billion dollar organization with tens of thousands of employees. One is entrepreneurial companies like to come up with ideas and make them happen quickly. Big companies will take time to decide whether to do that idea or not and plan for it in the future. And so I inject that pace and I inject that innovation and that creativity and have the benefits of the big companies. So ideally, if you take the benefits of both, it's very powerful. Coming up, Lord Karen Billamoria discusses global economic challenges. Every country in its own way is feeling a challenge. How do you deal with a challenge like that where so much of it is outside your control? The energy costs of the global economy, shipping costs, in some instances, have gone up 10 times. Lord Karen Billamoria carefully created Cobra Beer to complement curry and for the past three decades, the company has reaped the benefits of big repeat orders from Indian restaurants all around the world. But since the pandemic, the hospitality sector, one of Cobra's biggest markets, has been impacted heavily. We have seen alcohol sales actually hold up throughout the course of the pandemic, but Cobra is very much aligned with the restaurant business, which was hit really hard. So did that expose a vulnerability in the business in a way? And how has it ultimately impacted how you work now? Cobra started with the restaurants, with the Indian restaurants. And we've built up a foundation where customers discovered our product in the restaurants. And then later on, when we got into the supermarkets, would buy the beer from the shelves. To this day, the restaurants are our foundation and our base. And I will always be grateful to them. And we supply 7,000 restaurants in the UK. During the pandemic, we had lockdowns. When we had lockdowns, those restaurants were shut. For several months, many, many months, in 2020, 2021, those restaurants were shut, which meant we had no business through those restaurants at all. And what my priority was to try and support my customers as best as I could. And fortunately, at that very time, pure serendipity, I also happened to be president of the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, the largest business organization in the UK. So I was able to help not just British industry on the whole, but my own industry as well. And we, the government in the UK provided 400 billion pounds worth of support to business, including many support schemes that were very useful for the restaurants. And from a Cobra beer point of view, what really helped us was our supermarket sales. So we had no sales for the restaurants, but our supermarket sales not just held up well, they increased a lot as well. So that being on the shelf really helped us. Mm. So from a, a financial operational impact, could you elaborate a little more on the type of impact that we actually saw on the business? Well, without a doubt, our profits fell, our sales fell, um, but we were in a resilient position, not just to survive, but to be really resilient and in a position to support our customers as much as we could and help them as much as we could. I would hold webinars with, with the whole industry where I'd be able to update them on the latest developments, give them advice on the support they could get from government. Um, so we did everything we could to help our customers and help our industry who've helped us so much. And so what do you do now to continue to build on that resilience moving forward? Because it would seem that, of course, we're not fully out of the impact of the virus just yet. One of my favorite sayings of Winston Churchill's is, when you're going through hell, keep going. And, and we kept going and we didn't give up. And, and our customers kept going. And luckily in the UK, thanks to the government support, our unemployment figures are actually only slightly higher than they were before the pandemic, which was one of the lowest levels since the 1970s. So the, the economy is held up in that sense, but we've also got massive challenges looking forward mm. globally. Mm. I mean, the UK and globally, we've got inflation, we've got supply chain issues, we've had energy prices rocketing, we've got labor shortages, we've got interest rates going up, uh, and the inflation figures are expected in the UK alone to reach over 7%. And this is a global phenomenon. So we've got to be resilient to be able to get through what is a fragile recovery from already having gone through health. So it's not easy, and this is where government support is gonna to continue to be needed. What is the point of having 400 billion pounds spent 
in saving businesses and the economy if you're not willing to follow through with it. And that follow through may not be another 400 billion pounds, but it does require continuing that support to help your economy get through. And that also means in the UK's case, we've put up taxes to the highest level in 70, 70 years. This is the worst time to put up taxes because business has suffered so much already and that will stifle the recovery and growth. So help me understand how you're reading the outlook for the global economy and the UK economy. There's no shortage of challenges, as you say, soaring inflation, rising energy costs, supply chain issues. We have issues within the labor market as well. Now you say the UK government has been raising taxes. Just elaborate on that for me and why you think this could have a seriously negative impact on business on the ground there. So what the government's got to do is to encourage growth. And to do that, you've got to encourage investment. And the UK is one of the highest recipients of inward investment in the world. We're the second or third, third largest recipient of inward investment in the world. If you encourage invest, investment in your country from outside, if you encourage your businesses to invest domestically, if the government itself invests, then that will help to create growth. It's the growth that you need because that growth will then create the jobs that will then pay the taxes. And look at the UK. From 1993 until the financial crisis in 2008, in those 15 years, we grew at an average rate of 3% a year. After the financial crisis, we basically flatlined. And now, if we're predicting growth rates of 1.3, 1.6%, that's not good enough. We should be targeting to grow at the 3% a year that we used to grow before. But that's not going to happen on its own. It's going to happen if government and business work together to generate that growth. We've spoken about rising energy costs contributing to what's now being called a cost of living crisis on the ground in the UK. Has the government done enough to address this? And should they be taking more responsibility for homes and households who are clearly struggling right now? The reality is it's a global fragile recovery. It's not just the UK. Every country in its own way is feeling the challenge. And how do you deal with a challenge like that where so much of it is outside your control as a government? The energy costs are a global phenomenon. Shipping costs, some, in some instances, have gone up 10 times. So it's how you deal with it, with the government's concern, in terms of encouraging investment and growth. So I believe the answer is not to put up taxes. The Indian government, for example, they've had two budgets running, including in February this year, where they have not put up taxes. Because they've said, if you put up taxes, business have suffered already, and you might stifle the recovery. And what is the result of that? The IMF have forecast that India this year is going to be the fastest major economy in the world, fastest growing at 9%. So that's the solution, is support from the government, the follow through of all the vast measures that so many governments have put in through the pandemic, carrying that support through. And it's businesses and consumers alike that are suffering. Now the British government has just announced that the heating cap is going to go up by 50%. So it's that much more expensive. Consumers are already struggling with inflation on lots of other products. And then on top of it all, businesses don't have any energy cap. We take the full burden of any energy increase ourselves. Certain businesses that are high energy in, in, in intensive industries need help. Um, but on the whole, that's something that businesses, it's part of our cost. Yeah. But then what, the result of that is you have to, you bear as much of it as you can, but you also have to put up your prices. And we're all having to put up our prices. And the problem with that is then you get into a vicious cycle uh, where you, you've got the problems, you've got the prices going up, you have to put up your, your prices, which means the consumer has to pay more, which means you know, that they're already, there's wage inflation that's very high and overall inflation is very high. So you've got to control it. And how do you control it using a combination of fiscal measures, um, monetary measures, uh, but also supply side measures? It's very, very difficult. Still to come on the CNBC Conversation. Lord Caron on the measure of success. It's not a destination, it's a journey. So I, I've got so much more to do with my own business. Welcome back to the CNBC Conversation. I'm Dan Murphy at the University of Birmingham's Dubai campus to speak with the university's chancellor, Lord Karen Billamoria. We'll talk about your focus here in Dubai. You're going to be speaking about the relationship between the UK and the UAE. 
How would you describe that relationship? How would you characterize it? And why is it so important? The relationship historically with this region has been very important for the United Kingdom. And going forward, it's a very important area from a, a trade and business point of view uh, for, for the UK. Uh, and not, not only Dubai itself, not only the UAE, uh, but the whole of the Gulf. So since Brexit, the UK has now had the ability to forge our own trade deals with countries in the world, regions of the world. Uh, for example, we, we, and I think, again, hats off to our, our, our trade department. It didn't exist. Uh, it's only been around since 2016. But we have rolled over 66 bilateral trade agreements that the European Union had with other countries before the deadline. I mean, that was a feat in itself, which the CBI played a role in helping to get over the line. On top of that, we've just signed a trade deal with, with Australia. I mean, that Australia FTA was negotiated in one year, and it's the most comprehensive free trade deal in the world. It covers everything, goods, services, innovation, IP, mobility, uh, small, uh, medium-sized enterprises. It's, it's a really comprehensive deal. We're about to sign one with, soon with New Zealand. Um, we just launched uh, the free trade deal negotiations with India, which is going to be a very big deal for the United Kingdom. And the GCC uh, grouping is a very important one for the UK as well. And I think we, that is a top priority for us, is to sign a trade deal with the GCC. Exactly. So tell me what that might look like as Britain continues to shape its role and presence in a post-Brexit environment. A trade deal with the GCC, what might that entail? Well, with these trade deals, you want them to be as comprehensive as possible. You want them to ideally involve tariff-free, duty-free movement of goods and services. And the whole idea is to open up access. And that access means you can do more trade. And the more trade you do, the greater the benefit to both regions, to the UK and the GCC countries. And the more mobility you have, uh, the better it is as well, particularly youth mobility. For example, in the Australia trade deal, 18 to 35 year olds from both countries can work and travel in each other's countries for three years, unrestricted. And that youth mobility is very important. Um, Lord Karen, before we wrap up, I wanted to focus back on you and back on your career. You've already achieved so much. Is there anything else that you would like to do? <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the success is it's not a destination, it's a journey. And in many ways, I just feel I've just been so lucky to have been given these opportunities to, to, to study in the UK, to work in the UK, to build my business from scratch in the UK, to create a household name in the UK, which I'm so proud of, Cobra Beer, which I believe has got enormous growth potential, particularly globally. I was sold, for example, in, in Dubai, in the UAE. So I, I've got so much more to do with my own business, uh, being chancellor of one of the biggest universities in the UK. What a privilege that has been for me to be in the House of Lords now for 15 years, to start as one of the three youngest peers in the House of Lords um, and have that ability to contribute in Parliament on a, on a daily basis. What a privilege to have been President of the Confederation of British Industry at the time of global crisis. I mean, I'll forever be known as a pandemic president. Uh, that, that, that all these wonderful opportunities, I hope that there will be many more opportunities going forward. And in many ways, I feel I've only just started. Do you have any advice for other young entrepreneurs who would like to get started in business? What would you say to them today? You know, anyone young today, anywhere in the world, who is fortunate enough to have the ability, the access to education, first thing, most important thing I would say is try and get the best education that you can probably get. So whether you're a student or whether you're starting a business, you've got to think globally. And you've got to realize there is no limit to what you can achieve. There is no limit. Um, it's, it's all about aspiring. It's all about achieving. And it's all about going the extra mile. And, and, I, and when I hire people, I look for will rather than skill. Ideally both, but the attitude is the most important thing. Lord Karen Villamoria, thank you for joining me on the CNBC Conversation. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. And that's all for this edition of the CNBC Conversation. I'm Dan Murphy in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Thanks for watching.